Everybody, how we doing today? Good, it is a good morning. The sun is shining. Anybody else thankful the sun is shining besides me? <laughs> hey, before we, uh, we continue on, there's a couple of cool things uh, happening in the room. Uh, uh, we got a couple of, I, I see uh, Bonet's, and did I see uh, Jackson's? Where did Jackson's go? Jackson's in the... Where, oh, all the way in the back in the cheap seats. All right. That's cool. Uh, uh, Dad, can you stand up and introduce your little baby? Yeah, right now. This is Oakland Ray. Oakland Ray. All right. Good job. Beautiful baby. Dad, Dad, you got this, Dad. I believe in you. Is your... Is, oh, she's attached? Okay. <laughs> you can still introduce... Mom, you can introduce. Little... Adelie Peach. So, congratulations, moms, dads. Little Oakland, little, little Adelie. Uh, and... Uh, where's, Brand where's Brandon? Where's Brandon? Brandon, where, can I? Oh, can you guys stand up? Recently married, uh, Brandlin and Nadine, congratulations. <laughs> Christmas Eve Eve, newlyweds. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for spending your honeymoon with us. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Congrats, guys. We're happy for you. We have a, a, a new marriage beginning, a new baby's beginning. That's awesome. Uh, did I miss any babies? <laughs> Okay, all right. You guys going to start working on getting a baby together or something? Okay. All right, let me pray. <laughs> oh. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the uh, joy of being able to gather with our brothers and sisters. Uh, we rejoice still in the Advent season and the work of Christ and uh, ask that you would uniquely speak to us this morning, uh, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, December 29th uh, is, is that today? December 29th. It's always kind of a weird in-between phase. Anybody else feeling that weirdness? Like, what am I supposed to be doing with my life right now? Uh, and, and so, in the life of a church, it's typically kind of an in-between time where you're, you're transitioning from one thing to the next. And we wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to share a little bit about this thing that we've been talking about for over a month now, the Sunday shift, which happened today, uh, thus our new service times. You know, the, the, uh, I don't know who originally came up with the analogy, but... Uh, you've probably heard it before. If you haven't heard it, it'd be good to hear it. But somebody said, hey, I don't want to spend my whole life climbing the ladder. People often use that as a phrase. I'm going to climb, get to the top of the ladder. I don't want to get, spend my life climbing to the top of the ladder and get to the top and then realize I climbed the wrong ladder. Uh, you know, in my, I don't climb ladders too much, but I, climb, I like to climb mountains. And oftentimes, I like to explore, and so I... It happens all the time. I hear about something. I hear about a place. I hear about a location, and I, and I have to go find it. I have to go discover it. And so the process of that is is usually it, it's negligible at best because you're trying to find something that you don't know where it is. And so on more than one occasion, I've spent hours, if not an entire day, climbing and and hiking and working to get to something, and I get to the top of a mountain, and I realize I'm not on, I'm not on the right mountain. <laughs> I've, I've, I've spent a heck of a lot of time trying to reach a destination that I thought was here, but it's not here. The, the reason I use both of those metaphors with you, whether it be the, the ladder or the mountain, is it would be tragic, and I hope you would agree, that it would be tragic if you spent your entire life pursuing something only to realize you'd been pursuing the wrong thing. It would be, it would be horrible if, if all of your life you had worked hard and put a lot of effort and time and energy into something only to realize, I've been 
going after the wrong thing. Do you agree with that? I, I, I would hope that all of us would say, I don't want to do that. Uh, the reason I mention that is because we uniquely as a church, not unique to us as a church, but as a church, we uniquely feel as though there is something that we should be pursuing. There is something that we should be striving for. There is something that we should be seeking to accomplish and realize. And if we, if we don't accomplish it, then we will have wasted a lot of time and energy and, and effort. And so this morning what we wanted to do is take a little bit of time and say, okay, this is why we're making this shift on Sundays. Uh, we have new service times. We, we went from three to two. We have a bigger gap in between. Over the next couple of weeks, you're going to see some other changes, uh, physical changes on the property. But, but all for a reason uh, in, in that we, we believe that there's something that God has for us that we can do better at on Sunday mornings and we want to do better at on Sunday mornings. We believe that the mission of our church, which really should be the, the mission of every single person who who says they are a follower of Christ is a simple one, and it's this, make disciples. Make disciples. That is the thing that, of all things, we should be striving for and we should be working for. We should be spending energy and effort and resources to, to see that be accomplished. And if you're familiar with the church, if you've been around you know, the Christian faith for a while, you might have an idea of what that is. If you don't, let me give you the definition that we use around here. When we say make disciples, basically what we mean is growing to be more like Jesus and helping other people to do the same. We try to keep it as simple as possible. To make disciples means I'm going to, be grow, I'm going to grow to be more like Jesus and I'm going to help other people do the same. What that means is, in the course of your life, and, and I know your lives are as complex and complicated as mine, and there are all kinds of things that, and many of them worthy things that I need to give time and attention to. Uh, you know, washing the dishes and uh, changing the oil in the car and taking out the garbage and making sure your bills are paid and going to work and uh, getting, getting sleep and cleaning the house and raking up the pine needles and uh, volunteering in worth, worth, worthwhile organizations. So there are, every single one of your lives have lots of commitments that you should do well that you should give time and attention to, that you should be a good steward of. However, not, not at the expense of making disciples. Not at the expense of growing to be more like Jesus and helping others to do the same. Why is that? Why is it that we should not do all of those things to the neglect of disciple making? It's because it's the heart of of what Christ wants for us. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Bible's divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the first book of the New Testament is a book <clears throat> named Matthew. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all tell the story of Jesus' life from a slightly different perspective. But the, the book of Matthew has, at the end of it, in chapter 28, a passage of Scripture that we call the Great Commission. And whenever something or someone is commissioned, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're being sent out, or you're, you're being given an, an assignment. And so Jesus, towards the end of his ministry, he's getting ready to, to leave the world, and he gives to his followers, his disciples, the first disciples, his great commission. So basically saying, hey, this is what you need to be doing. This is what your priority should be. Of all of those things that you might be involved in, don't neglect this thing. And it says in verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so the commission, the primary mission that Jesus is giving to his followers, therefore what we believe is, is what Jesus has given us uh, as a church, which is essentially a bunch of indiv individual followers of Jesus brought together. 
And so it's not only our individual mission, it's our corporate mission as a church is to make disciples. And so essentially what that means is that you, uh, if you have been, if you have received this commission given by Jesus, it should be a priority of your life. It should be a priority of your life to be committed to not only yourself growing to be more like Jesus, but also helping others to do the same. If, if you have received this, this commission, if you believe, in, and this is what I believe, this is my conviction, and I hope it's yours, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not something that, if it's true, if it is true that Jesus is who he says he is, and if it's true that Jesus did live the life that we believe he did, if it's true that Jesus did die and was raised from the grave, that is not a, a truth or a belief that is part of my life. That is a belief that must become my entire life. It can't just be something that I relegate to a portion or to a time of my week, a Sunday morning or otherwise. My entire life, if that is true, if Jesus is God and if he did die and if he did rise from the grave, then my entire life needs to be reshaped and reformed around him. And it doesn't mean I neglect these things. It doesn't mean that I neglect my job or neglect doing the dishes or neglect changing the oil in the car. It just means that all of those things revolve around my first and foremost primary commitment to making disciples. Me personally growing to be more like Jesus and helping others to do the same. If you've been following Jesus for any length of time, you should be more like Jesus today than when you first started following him. Ten years from now, if you truly have embraced this grace, great commission, then ten years from now, you should be able to look back at your life and say, hey, these are the things that were true about my life then that are no longer true now. Or these are the things that have been reshaped and reformed. These are the things that maybe I've seen my priorities shift. These are the things that seem to more reflect what Jesus would want for my life. That's why we say the vision for our church if we're doing our mission well, if we're truly doing a good job of making disciples, then we are going to see, tangibly see lives transformed, living out the values and the priorities of Jesus. What does transformation speak of? Transformation speaks of something that looks different than it used to. It means that something has changed. The thing that we think should be changed is if Jesus values something, if it's a priority of Jesus, then increasingly that thing should be of value in my life. It should increasingly be the priorities of my life. Now, here's, here's the challenging question. Uh, if, if the primary... So let's assume Jesus did live the life that we believed he lived. He did die. He did rise from the grave. He did defeat the power of sin and death. He did then say, I, I'm going to entrust you with this great commission of not only growing to be more like me, but helping others to do the same. If that is the priority for which we should be reshaping and, and reforming our life around, how well, don't answer out loud, how well are we as a church doing in obedience to that great commission? How would you say your life has been shaped and transformed by Jesus? How well would you say you're doing at helping others to discover the beauty and the goodness of who Jesus is? In our, in our church today, let's say in Western Christianity, if you were to survey most people who are not Christians and ask them, would you say that there's a definitive difference between those who are followers of Christ and those who are not? If you were to ask people to say, hey, if, if Christ is, is about grace and mercy and truth, are Christians uniquely about grace and mercy and truth? If, if the defining description of a follower of Christ is love, are Christians exceptionally better at loving than non-Christians? If, if the commitment of Christ is to care for those who are, 
poor and those who are hurting and suffering, would you, would you recognize this definitive difference in those who are followers of Christ at being the champions of justice in the world? I'm, I'm not sure that there would be a vast distinction. And so what that, what that forces us to say is, maybe something in our methodology is not working as well as it should. Maybe there's something in our, in our, the means by which we're going about making disciples that's somewhat ineffective. A quote from uh, Alan Hirsch, he's an author, kind of a forward thinker, would recommend anything that he writes to help, help you think about this, but in his latest book, Reformation, which I love the title, uh, Reframing Reformation, he says this, now discipleship might be the single biggest flaw in the Western form of Christianity. It is almost as if church as we know it is designed to exclude active discipleship and encourage stunted forms of Christianity. And so what Alan Hirsch is describing is perhaps the structure of church today in Western Christianity not only isn't designed to best produce disciples, maybe it's actually encouraging a stunted form of Christianity. When I think of that stunted form, I think of stunted growth. Have you heard that phrase? Those of you, especially maybe parents, ideally if somebody's getting, a child's getting the proper nutrition and everything's healthy, they're going to be meeting certain uh, you know, standards of growth, but if something, if there's malnutrition, their growth is stunted. They're not, they're not where they should be. And what Alan Hirsch is saying, perhaps the structure, perhaps the design of church has stunted Christianity to the point where we're not seeing disciples made like we should be. Or maybe the transformation towards uh, sharing the values and the priorities of Jesus isn't happening as much as it should be. In terms of Christians embracing this great commission, the greatest, the greatest honor and privilege a human could be given to represent Christ to the world and to help other people to grow in their knowledge and love for Christ. Maybe, maybe Christians aren't as excited and mobilized toward that end as they should be. So here's the challenging question that I alluded to earlier. If, if, if you're a follower of Christ... And if you truly believe that Jesus lived and died and rose from the grave and that your life should be reformed around his will for your, for your life, and his will for your life is to help other people discover who Jesus is and to grow to be more like Jesus, to make disciples, don't answer the question out loud, how well are you personally doing at that? Who can, you, who can you look to in your life and say, this person or these people, because, because Christ has commissioned me, because I value the beauty of what Christ has done, and because I believe it is revolutionary, and because I believe that it changed the course of humanity, and because he's commissioned me to help others discover who he is and to help, help them reshape and reform their life around Christ, he's personally entrusted that work to me. If you are a follower of Christ, who, who can you speak to in your life that you're helping in that process with? I would venture to guess that one of the stunted forms of Christianity is that we're all very busy doing church things, but we're maybe not busy doing the thing that matters most, making disciples. Which leads to the question, how do we do better? How do we do better at that? Uh, here, here's our conviction as a church. And, and this conviction is based upon the life of Jesus himself. 
in looking at the life of Jesus and seeing. Okay, so Jesus says, go make disciples. We look at, at the life of Jesus and say, how did Jesus do it? And here's our conviction of a church, a conviction for us as a church. Discipleship requires relationship. Discipleship requires relationship. Discipleship requires relationship. That's why you've probably heard us over the last few years say intentional, meaningful relationships. It's because we believe discipleship. <clears throat> if we are going to be obedient to the Great Commission of Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he has given you a commission to help other people grow to be more like Jesus. He has given that responsibility to you. It's not the responsibility only of pastors or of an institution or an organization. It is your responsibility as a follower of Christ. So you should be able to look around you and say, I've got these people in my life that I'm, I'm very intentionally and meaningfully helping them to, to discover more of who Jesus is. The best way that that happens is in the context of relationship. More specifically, what happens in the context of that relationship. Dave Gibbons, who is an author, he writes about discipleship. He says this. I think I still have a typo in this quote, but you'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, yes, it's still there. Uh, discipleship. Discipleship is choosing to do life together. Choosing to live life with people. That's where the messiness of discipleship takes root and begins to grow. It's where the soil is tilled in the daily life, in the daily life and routines of community. Discipleship requires relationship. And so what Dave Gibbons is saying and what we believe to be true is that the best way for discipleship to happen, the best way for you to grow to be more like Jesus, the best way for you to help others to grow to be more like Jesus is in the context of relationships. Now let me, let me translate that to what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the Sunday shift. There is perhaps a fatal flaw in terms of discipleship related to Sunday morning church. Anybody figure out what it is? It's not very relational sometimes. Do you know everybody in the row in front of you? In the row behind you? It's, it's why we've been saying for the last several weeks, we hope that you, on Sunday mornings, part of your shift is that you, you don't come late to church. Why is that? It's because if you're coming late, you're zooming in, in the parking lot, you're getting out of your car, you're rushing in, and there's no, relation, there's no relational connection. It's why we're saying, it's why we created a bigger gap, 45 minutes between, so that after the service is done, you're not busting out of here, heading to your car, going home, opening the garage door, pulling in and closing it, without ever having connected relationally to somebody on a Sunday morning. It's why we're hoping the shift is way more about the service times and going just to two and in the bigger gap. It's, it's far more about how you, every single one of you, functions when you come here on a Sunday morning. Hopefully, what we see happen is when you come here, you say, oh, I don't know that person. I'm going to introduce myself. Hopefully, what you're doing is you're introducing an old friend to a new friend. Hopefully you're saying, hey, uh, after the service, let's go grab a cup of coffee over at Common Grounds and sit down and get to know each other a little bit. Hopefully what happens is you're finding out how people are doing and you're saying, hey, how was your week? And then you listen really good. Anybody else have the sense that we're not very good listeners anymore? Really good talkers, not very good listeners. I saw a picture last week, somebody over here against this wall, I don't, know, I don't know what the context was, but I saw a husband and a wife praying for another person, I thought, that's the picture. Hopefully, you, you, as you're listening and people are speaking and, and you sense, hey, this person, probably one of the best things I can do is pray, and so in the midst of what happens on Sunday morning, you're praying, you're engaging, you're connecting, you're finding out who people are. You're, 
Some of you, are, you lean towards being in, introverts. So some of you probably are going to have to work a little bit harder. Some of you are extroverts. You might need to dial it back a little bit. You're kind of annoying. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But I hope you see... <clears throat> I hope you see why we're trying to make this shift. We're here 52 times every year. That's way, that's way too much time not to do the best that we can in the context of this environment to see discipleship happen. We don't want a single person ever to step foot on this campus on a Sunday morning and feel lonely or to feel like they don't have a place. I, my hope is that every single person that comes onto this, onto this campus on a Sunday morning leaves here thinking, this is where I belong. This is where I'm loved. People care about me here. People are, are, are investing in me. And I hope, I hope that it goes both ways. We, we spent a lot of time processing over the past year, uh, talking with each other, praying, studying scripture, Real quick, I wanted to share with you kind of a focus. It's, here's what we realized. We, as we talk about intentional, meaningful relationships, the reason that we do that is because we believe that that's how disciples are going to be best made. But then what we figured out is people don't really know what an intentional, meaningful relationship is. And those words help, but we're, we want to give you a couple of things that maybe you can just hang your hat on, something that you can drive a stake in the ground that are just markers of potentially what an intentional, meaningful relationship is. This is not a formula. It's, it's not something that should become uh, formulaic, for, for lack of uh, better words. But four things that we believe, if you insert these into your relationships, will dramatically increase our ability to make disciples. Let me just share, share them with you real quick. First one is this, teach. Challenge is the second one encourage, and pray. Teach, challenge, encourage, pray. Teach, challenge, encourage, pray. Part of the stunted growth of Christianity is most people who are followers of Christ, they have a desire to make disciples, they just don't know how. And the reason we don't know how is nobody's done it for us. If I, if I speak to you this morning and you say, boy, I really, yeah, you're right. I don't know if I can speak to somebody in my life that I'm helping to grow to be more like Jesus, that I am discipling. Chances are good if there's a struggle for you, it's because nobody's ever done it for you. We may, we've had a couple of generations of stunted Christianity where we're not very good at disciple making. We're good at a lot of other things, but disciple making we're not necessarily good at. And so the reason that we came up with these is, is just because these are some things that may be helpful for you to know, hey, when I'm in a, the way that my relationship is going to become both intentional in, and meaningful is if somewhere in the aspect of that relationship, there's, I'm going to teach and challenge and encourage and pray. And I might not do all of those things in a conversation, all of you, if you're saying, boy, I don't know how to teach, well, you, you might need to reshape what you think teaching is. You could be following Jesus for just a couple of weeks, and you know the work that Jesus has done in your life. If you share that with somebody else that's teaching, it doesn't take much. Teaching for Jesus, sometimes he taught in a large group, sometimes he taught on a mountain, but Jesus, one of, his, one of the, 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 the moments that he really shined at, that he was so good at, it was just teaching in the context of ordinary life. And so one of the, one of the things, anybody ever hear the passage, I am the vine, you are the branches, he that abides in me will bear much fruit. And we read that in scripture, and I could preach a sermon on it, and it would probably, hopefully, have some meaning or value, but we lose the context of the fact that why did Jesus say that to his disciples? It's because Jesus was in relationships. Discipleship requires relationship. And because he was in a relationship, he spent time with his disciples. And Jesus was with his disciples, and one day they happened to be walking through a vineyard. And guess what happens when you walk through a vineyard? You see grapes. I know. And if I'm walking through a vineyard and I see grapes, I'm eating grapes. 
Anybody else eating some grapes? And so Jesus walking along with his disciples, and they're walking through a vineyard. They're going from point A to point B. Why? Because they're just doing life together. They're in relationship with each other. And Jesus walks along and he plucks some grapes and they're popping them in their mouth and they're like, yeah, these grapes are good. Yeah, I know they're good. He says, hey guys, stop for just a minute. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you abide in me, you're going to bear a lot of fruit. And the disciples went, wow. That's cool. That's teaching. And in the midst of ordinary common life, there are all kinds of teaching moments If that, that God will present to you if we're intentional and if we're meaningful in those relationships. Everybody needs challenged. The only way that I'm going to grow to be more like Jesus is if I have people in my life, and there are people in my life, who say, Donovan, I think that maybe you, you just need a little course correction here. Donovan, the way that you said that probably wasn't the best way to say that. The way that you uh, spoke to your son probably wasn't the most loving way to speak to your son. Or the way that you did, I need challenge. That's the only way I'm going to grow. And so I, I as, a, as a disciple of Christ, have to both be willing to challenge and to receive challenge. Teach and challenge. Encourage. Anybody ever been encouraged? Okay, a few of you. How did it make you feel? I got an A-OK. I heard an awesome. Makes, makes you feel good, right? What does it do when you get encouraged? What does it make you want to do? Do it more. Do it more. And so one of, the, one of the best ways for us to make disciples is to be in relationship, in close proximity to other people, that when we see them, expressing or living out the values and priorities of Jesus, we, we recognize it. And we affirm it and we say, boy, this, I, I really love seeing in that you, because that's God, I saw God working in your life through that. That's how we're going to go, praying, praying for each other. I already mentioned one, one of the ways that we can do that. The value of, of praying and being prayed for in the moment when we sense that somebody's going through something, say, can I pray for you for that and pray for them now? Do not dismiss the power of your prayers for other people. One of our high schoolers graduated last year. I think we prayed for him on a Sunday morning. Will went off to the uh, military. Is it, there's parents in here? Uh, what? What did I say? Military. Okay, to be more specific, his sister... <laughs> His sister says Marines. Okay. Okay. That's his sister. She's a proud sister. So Will, before he went to the Marines, before he went to Marine boot camp, he said, Donovan, hey, can I be praying for you? Which, I don't know if it's, I don't know why, but people don't ask that much of me. And I said, sure. And I thought, I thought like, yeah, you know, high school kid. And, and, I, and I said, are you really going to pray for me? He said, yeah. He said, what can I pray for? And so I told him. And so he went, went to uh, boot camp and graduated from boot camp, Marine boot camp. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, his mom and dad came back because they went to see him after the ceremony. And they said, hey, Will says hi. And he wanted me to tell you that he's been praying for you. You know what a blessing that was to me? What an encouragement that was to me, a high school kid, to, to let, just to know that he was praying for me meant the world. That's something every single one of you who is a follower of Christ can do for somebody else. Teach, challenge, encourage, pray. And maybe you don't do all four of those things. It might be weird if you did them all in a conversation and be like, whoa, <laughs> easy. <laughs> But somewhere in the course of your relationships to be thinking about, hey, what is, it, what is it that I can help show about maybe what Scripture says about the situation? How can I challenge this person in a loving way? How can I encourage them? How can I be praying for them? If we do that more, I believe we'll do better at making disciples. 
And that's why we're talking about him. We, we hope that that kind of thing happens more on Sunday mornings. Shifting every single one of you who is a follower of Christ. We, don't, we as a church, we as a church 10 years from now, don't want to look back and say, man, we, we were busy doing a lot of things, but we didn't, we didn't make disciples very well. We don't want to say that. And so what we're hoping is that every single one of you who is a follower of Christ would say, I've, Christ has, has given me this honor of representing him. Christ has given me this honor of, of helping me to show how good uh, he is. And if I reshape and reform my life around him, and grow to be more like him and share his values and priorities, that is, that's the heart of what he wants me to do. And I can do, and I should do a lot of good things. I should, I should do the dishes, and I should clean the house, and I should pay my bills, and I should do all of those things. But not at the, not at the neglect, neglect of the most important thing. I, I get so excited when I think about a church a church where the majority of people are actively part of making disciples. I get so excited thinking that all of us, if we're collectively growing every year to be more and more like Christ, and when people come to know Christ and we help them to grow, do you see the picture of what that looks like? Do you see the value of a group of people who progressively more and more are sharing the values of Jesus and the priorities of Jesus and it grows and that influence increases and, and people, it's perceivable in our families and in our workplaces and in our community? Part of, it's not the solution. Part of the solution is how we shift on Sunday mornings. And I need your help. I need everybody's help. Uh, we've got to do it together. Practically speaking, uh, Dave, can you come up and we're going to close with, with uh, the Lord's Supper. Super practical, super practical. December 29th typically is a low attendance Sunday, but you can probably imagine that on Sunday mornings moving forward, we're going to need you guys to be very selfless in where you park and where you sit, scooch in. Things are going to get a little tight in here, so be accommodating, be kind, be loving, uh, I know the aisle seats are primo. You might have to move in. Fill in the front and center first. Those things practically will help, but far less important than how you function on a Sunday morning. If you're, if you're helping with communion, go ahead and pass things out. That's great. And here's my encouragement for you this morning. Uh, hold, on to the, hold on to the elements. Hold on to the bread and the juice. And we want to create a little bit of space here for the Holy Spirit to uniquely speak to you in terms of this aspect of discipleship. Allow him to maybe guide you, to lead you, to say something to you that maybe he needs to say, to encourage you in some way that you need encouraged. But specifically, would you reflect on, on your part in this church family and your commitment to this process of discipleship. And we're, we're going to give, like I said, some space to the Spirit of God just to speak uniquely to you. Hold on to the elements. Uh, we will stand in just a moment and take them together. Um, but in the meantime, take a little bit of time in, in meditative prayer. <laughs>